I think one of the things that this conference has done is to persuade me that this world is even more full of people who can turn it around than I ever dared hope. If I could invent a machine to show you what I want to say, as brilliant as Eric Rosenbaum's, I would. We share one thing in common. I have none of his ingenuity or wit, but <clears throat> this is a talk which in many ways is about voices. And though I can't, as a writer, reproduce them as beautifully as I would like, I hope you will listen for them underneath what I have to say. I start by going backwards into my own childhood. But one of the things about doing that that I want you to understand is that this is a piece finally not about me. It's using my experience to ask you to think about how people learn. Where, when, and from whom. So what follows is a kind of story. And though I'm close to its center, I don't want to be its point. The story might, I hope, provoke in you some new reflections about what we mean by education and learning but also, I hope, encourage in you considerable skepticism about the so-called and current educational reforms. Uh, I will address some of those issues of reform at the very end. It was a long time ago. In that small farm town, school did not matter much. It asked little of me or my peers. No homework, nothing difficult, only how to overcome its deadly boredom. Oh, I do remember still, amazingly, the names of all my teachers from kindergarten to sixth grade. And if I had time, I could still uh, do characterizations of each and every one of them. <laughs> because one of the ways when you're in school, poor public schools, dull public schools, you spend a lot of time inventing imitations, jokes, etc. So I did. Uh, I was not an impressive student in terms of being a model. And in middle school, I do remember still the two memorable teachers of my formal public school days, Elsie Van Lu in social studies and Frida Hall in math. They were to be reckoned with and closely attended. In town and countryside where I grew up, intellectual life, as conveniently conceived, had only negative value as one more oppressive expression of inequality, a game of snobbery, and a pretense of superiority. College was neither a goal nor available except to the children of the two doctors and the two lawyers and the very few families of wealth, exactly two, in the town. Most people expected to live and die in this one place. Then there were Mary Deffendorf and my mother, Bert O'Connell. This is my mother and this is Mary. Uh, my mother was a bookkeeper, Mary was a nurse, and I've never met two people in my life quite like them. Master teachers though they never, ever would have thought of themselves that way. They were best friends, most often together in my mom's small kitchen, smoking, drinking coffee or beer, and talking. The talk was as rich in wit as it was in compassion. The subjects in my memory seemed never to be about the world beyond Raven, New York, this village of some 1,300, and the farmers and workers in the surrounding fertile hills. For a long time, the two allowed me to hear or overhear only stories about their work. They were always aware that my ears were around. More Mary at the nursing home, which was next door, my mother as a clerk bookkeeper at the farm supply store my dad managed. They were the main act in my daily life, often my delight, the source of laughter as well as reminders of how much pain there can be in daily life. Mary was exuberantly humorous, my mother drier, the mistress of timing and the memorable phrase, hard when you were her son, because it was often directed at me, um, about, about a particular and stiff and stingy and notoriously so farmer, my mother's characterization was, he was born with an iron rod up his ass. <laughs> many, many more. I could do a whole talk on my mother's sins. I know now that it was my mother who taught me to love language and all its play and to use it with style. Nothing in school equaled her lessons. From Mary's humane laughter, I learned sympathy for others and even a delight in recognizing in the foibles of others my own foolishness. Through them, I came to know about a large cast of characters. Many remain alive in my mind. The head carpenter for the farm store, 
legendary for his nearly complete silence. Getting instruction from him was a matter of watching one eyebrow, eyebrow go slightly up, which meant you were in the wrong, and one go down, which meant we can tolerate this. That was it. <laughs> um, he had a poker face, of course, for, and he, but he was also well known for his extraordinary skill and committed hard work, but as much for his second in command, a, a constant talker, an endless repository of dirty stories, a man who made humor his way of doing and getting by. Mirror images out of a stage comedy, these two. As I got older, the number of characters and situations grew too. Wives whose husbands abused them, those suspected of adultery, and the known adulterers. Uh, the, those suspected were the source of the richest stories, actually. Uh, <laughs> those who drank too much too often. Everyone I knew <coughs> drank and drank a good deal. So recognizing excess required uh, close observation and special <laughs> skill. <laughs> or the handsome car salesman whose sexual charisma was intense enough that even I, as a 10-year-old, sensed it and who may have bedded nearly every attractive younger woman in the town. Different characters than just the wayward figured at least as much in Mary's and Mom's talk. The cleaning lady, a single mother, who had several children out of wedlock, praised and respected by both for her hard work, her devoted mothering, and how she handled her inescapable poverty. Thinking about her was an early lesson in the possibility of courage and grace in daily life, no matter. My head grew full of characters, many dimensioned, and no two alike. And I have to skip a little because I can't tell you all of them. There was Mr. Paul on the street daily with apparently nothing to do. He and one sister were the last of a once large black family, the only black people in the town. His father, the town barber, all now gone somewhere but for these two survivors. I don't remember when I was taught always to call Mr. Paul Mr. But I understood then that respect especially belonged to those in struggle on the margins. With enough fading memory and all, I might be able to reconstruct this whole town. But other vital stories pressed to be told about this place, I once thought thin and narrow and hopelessly <coughs> provincial. And to be sure sentimentality does not entirely qualify what I had to say, please remember Moravia, New York, was a town virtually entirely of poor working people. Alcoholism measured the forms of despair, riddling many, many lives. Opportunities of any kind were scarce. The most ambitious young men enlisted in the military. The most far-sighted women went to Syracuse, 40 miles away, to hairdressing school, an occupation which could give them a survival income independent of men. Few went on to college, though a few went to a nearby community college. Studying and reading books seriously could be, in fact always was, simply a sign of weirdness. In eighth grade, I discovered that by a freak of genetics, I could outdrink all of the boys in my class <laughs> times two. <laughs> a, a form of social status that I neither wished for nor rejected <laughs> that excused my love of reading. I could read as many books as I wanted, measured by how many times I had to drink people under the table. Like most of them, I was a klutz, too, so I wasn't an athlete, so that was the other way you could get away with reading. Like most of my fellows, turning 12 was also a turning point. Before that, I could get paying work summers, of course, but now, after school and Saturdays, I could legally work. So I did. It was expected. Little did I know that a new schooling was beginning. Clerking for the worldwide, in my eyes, pharmacist from the big city, Brooklyn, of course, and for McMahon's Five and Dime. But the thing I remember most vividly was when Joe Belinsky, who owned the local dairy, once my alcoholic uncle's dairy, he came to my dad to have me help him on his weekend milk routes on either side of Owasco Lake. When I started the milk runs with Joe, I believed that I pretty much knew my world. I'd worked on farms, gone with my dad to country bars when he was collecting bills, washed windows for half the people in town, my mother was well known for her demanding domestic skills, so people knew I would be allowed to get away with nothing. Babysat for most of the young families, and eavesdropped on every conversation I could safely catch. The milk run taught me something I expect and hope I will never forget. One weekend day, at the end of our run on the west side of the lake, 
Joe took a new route away from the village. Making fun, as he always did, of my constant questions, he finally said, just wait. Maybe you'll learn something. We turned and turned off the paved roads and onto several dirt roads. We came finally to a dead end in a clearing where sat a small trailer. I didn't know where we were, and I couldn't then or now retrace Joe's route. Out of the trailer came a big boned woman, not fat, maybe in her late 30s or early 40s. Though remember, at 12, I thought 20 was old, so my guess here couldn't be less reliable. Then a child came out of the trailer, and another, and another, and another, and another, almost like the old woman in the shoe. And I remember thinking, that story is true. <laughs> my shaky memory recalls that there were eight altogether. The mother, there was no doubt I believe, asked for one quart of regular milk and a small tub of cottage cheese. She had the exact amount of money ready. Joe took it and asked her if she could help him out. The cooling system, he explained, in the truck ran off a battery and had run down. This much was true. He had two more quarts of milk left, he said, set some sour cream and a large tub of cottage cheese. Could she take them? Otherwise, they would spoil before we got back to town. The woman eyed him suspiciously and said, now, Joe, you know I always pay for what I get. Joe's bluffness persuaded but did not fool her. Indeed, he opened the back of the truck and showed her these were the last items we had and the inside was getting warm. Her parting words with a smile were that she would help him out this time, <laughs> but that when he returned in two weeks, she would take only what she could pay for, which he later told me was one quart of milk every two weeks and one small tub of cottage cheese. There was no car by the trailer, by the way. I learned more from all of this than I can briefly summarize. So this is a summary only. About pride, about the quiet heroism of many women, especially those in poverty with children, about the mystery of character, in this case of her humor, the love she so clearly showed those children, her dignity, and simply the mystery of how anyone could ever manage what she was managing with such grace and such goodness. We make heroes in this culture who are mostly villains often. We do not celebrate the real ones. And we should stop it. This experience proved another lesson about not, assume, not assuming that I ever knew enough, uh, a lesson I've, I've kept having to learn. Poverty was something I knew in the village, but I never encountered in this degree or understood, as I now did, that rural poverty is all the more insidious, like any other poverty, for being so invisible. And there was the nursing home next door, where I had lessons from Mary Deffendorf I shall never forget, and I'll just summarize them briefly. Mary was the kind of person that when she walked into a room, the energy level, without her saying a word, just went up. The nursing home was filled with rows upon rows of beds, all, mostly all very poor people who were there because their families couldn't take care of them. And it was a depressing place, bluntly. Um, and when she came to work in the morning, the door would open, and she would say in this great loud voice with a laugh in the back of her throat, Mary's here. It's time to celebrate. And you could feel everybody in that place rise up. And one day, I was spared in the kitchen because they, somebody had not shown up, and Mary was there, and we had to change sheets. And I started to do this. With, it's very difficult to change a bed with somebody in it. I'm still not very good at this. She stopped me, and she said, Now look, you must always change these sheets so that the person in the bed knows that you love them and you respect them. And this is how you do it. And she showed me. And it was probably she talked, she caressed, she lifted very gently. She asked questions about how they wanted things done. I mean, it was, it was like watching an artist of care. How could anyone ever forget? Um, so that, that was the nursing home. It was right next to her house. And I was often asked to do vigils uh, in a separate room with people who were dying. That's another set of stories. In these settings, I went to school most deeply. These were my best teachers, sages, and guides, and perhaps the deepest lessons I have ever absorbed. But as I encountered and took them in, 
I did so with little self-consciousness. They got stored away without my noticing or having a hint about their significance. Only during and shortly after a tumultuous college career did I begin to realize what and how much I had learned from these men and women. Perhaps just growing up, which is one of the things college creates the space for, brings a capacious awareness sufficient to unlock the riches in one's primary environments. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but I do want to say that I did have some memorable teachers in college. But now, looking back, I think really what college gave me, more than anything else, was the means to have these experiences come to me to, and be understood. No one ever taught them, and in those days, no one ever talked about community engagement or you know, your experience. You were supposed to be a good scholar, which meant destroy the eye. So, um, college was hard because one of the things I had to do was reconcile an inward struggle between my love of books and learning, my father, who I admired above all other men and still do, who firmly opposed my going to college, and my loyalties to the other men and women with whom I had grown up. Being a student seemed a betrayal, not only of people I cherished, but an acquiescence in a world of privilege and people in it who simply assumed that they were superior. So here I want to turn away from what seems to be primarily my story, though I don't actually think of it that way, to thinking about how many students now have to endure the penalties of inadequate schools, severely limited family incomes, anxieties about betraying their own people by engaging schooling and reaching towards college. They must, must surmount fiercely high boundaries, some cultural and some complexly social and structural, and then of course there's the economic. Few current educational reformers recognize any of these barriers, and thus few even seek to address them. To do so would require admitting and tackling the massive inequalities characteristics that are coming out of our country now. These reformers focus only on formal schooling, not the whole environment. And many simply <coughs> demonize teachers. Good teachers, of course, do make a difference, but none of the current popular reforms do anything but further depress the quality of teaching. In any case, students arrive in schools from environments as influential in their ability to learn as what occurs in schools. Hardly a new point, but the current reform lingo ridicules addressing the inequalities that characterize the environments of so many young people. As damaging is the veil drawn over the utter miseducation of the already privileged students in class and racially so-called, racially segregated and so-called good schools. They're not. They're a scandal. Um, so we get, arguably, the most ignorant, privileged class in history. Schools can only be good to the extent our leaders and our teachers acknowledge the centrality of their students' environments and shape the school and the curriculum around ways of respecting those environments, coming to know those environments, <coughs> drawing people out in those environments, and from that, making contact with other worlds. Um, there are many stories in these worlds. And what you see in many urban schools is a profound disrespect. Um, no one learns in the context of not being respected. And of course, culturally, these students are disrespected. Uh, many of us are persuaded that our schools are failing, although I'm not sure our schools on the whole are any worse than they've always been. And I distrust the rhetoric of crisis uh, completely. Um, <coughs> The recommended remedies, the cure, as I said, are worse than the malady. Do standardized tests, state and federal curriculum st standards teach for America attacks on teachers achieve anything? Yes, all negative. Each of these, and all together, are thin fantasies held by an elite nearly entirely ignorant of the people they dare prescribe for. They are acts of power. They are not acts of remedy or knowledge. The powerful really are the least knowledgeable people generally in a society. So with that, I want to return very quickly to my teachers because I'm over my time. Mary Deffendorf, my mom, my dad, the woman with the trailer, Joe Belinsky, the single mother who cleaned houses, so many others. If they taught me little else, it was that wisdom and decency do not reliably belong to any single group, but that those who have power of any serious kind are likely in arrogance and ignorance to misuse it. We are at this moment too much at the mercy of just such people. 
Let us get rid of them. Thank <laughs> you.